pressed it. Thank you. Um, good. Well, um, welcome all to Justice for Palestinians webinar this evening, where we're going to have Daniel Macover speak, speaking to us. And um, uh, welcome to you all. And David Epstein is going to introduce Daniel uh, to us. David, over to you. Um, well, immediately after Israel's victory in the 1967 war, Daniel's father, Moshe Makova, and 11 other Israelis issued the following famous statement. Our right to defend ourselves from extermination does not give us the right to oppress others. And this was followed by some tragic, uncomfortable, but remarkably accurate prophecies. As a result of uh, this statement, the Makova family was forced to leave their home in Israel. But Israel's loss was the UK's gain. And now, as a minor consequence of these events, we have the privilege of listening to Daniel, one of the UK's leading human rights lawyers. Two remarkable court victories for Daniel were the arrest warrants he obtained for the Israeli general, Doron Almog, and for the Israeli cabinet minister, Tsipi Livni. In the event, the UK government failed to follow the rule of law and neither arrest warrant was implemented. However, the British public was made aware of the UK's shady friendships with some very shady characters. Daniel is interested in the denial of human rights in other areas as well. He is the chair of the trustees of the charity inquest, which investigates deaths in custody and detention. So welcome to this meeting, Daniel, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for inviting me. And thank you, David, for that kind introduction. Um, I would like to carry on reading where David left off from that declaration. So that, that declaration, which my father and um, several a small group, very small group of Israelis, including one Palestinian citizen of Israel, um, signed back in 1967. So this was 22nd of September 1967, published obviously in Hebrew in Haaret. So this is an English translation. As David started to say, our right to defend ourselves from extermination does not give us the right to oppress others. Occupation entails foreign rule. Foreign rule entails resistance. Resistance entails repression. Repression entails terror and counter-terror. The victims of terror are mostly innocent people. Holding on to the occupied territories will turn us into a nation of murderers and murder victims. Let us get out of the occupied territories immediately. So um, that was a stance he and a very small number of Israelis took and as David says, it's horribly prophetic. Um, I don't think any of them at the time, and in talking to my father now, could envisage the precise horrors that we now see unfolding since the 7th of October. But the context in which they happened, the history with which they, in which they happened, um, is there for all to see if they want to look. And um, obviously the events, I mean, this was written... 22 years after the end of the Second World War. So the, the, the thoughts and about um, the Holocaust and um, the first words of that were very much in the minds of those writing and speaking and acting then. But my father was at the time already moving towards a clear analysis of Zionism and settler colonialism. And I don't need to go there in this meeting, but um, the... Obviously, for all of us here, we understand history didn't begin on the 7th of October. 7th of October entailed clear, clear criminality on the part of Palestinian resistance in, in targeting civilians as part of what happened on the 7th. 
Um, but the response by the Israeli state goes well beyond any um, lawful response um, to, to those kind of attacks. Um, and clearly, it's in the minds of the government. Within days, um, scholars of genocide were saying, and the, and the outrageous element of it all is that the genocidal statements were being made by leading politicians from very early on after the 7th of October. 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, some of the most egregious incitements or actual um, genocidal intention were, were expressed and have been cited by the court in its ruling on the 26th of January. So many people looking at the legality of what was happening were already saying there are there is now already a risk of a genocide taking place because of the language being used. And in my view, there is a strong case, which won't be determined for years, um, for Israel to answer at the International Court of Justice. But my topic tonight was literally, what can the ICJ do to stop the slaughter in Gaza? And the short answer currently is it's not done it's not had the immediate impact that a law abiding state it should have had on a law abiding state. Um, and we hope that by the legal ripples, which I'm going to discuss, but also the very fact that it's still under imminent review. Um, and there has been a, another order made, um, albeit a limited order made on the 16th of February. Um, which I can come to in a minute, uh, it's really going to be the long-term impact in domestic um, courts and legal systems combined with what the ICJ does in the next few days and weeks um, in the follow-up, uh, which I'm going to describe in a minute, that will be the true measure of whether the court has done enough or can do enough or can do more or will do more to stop the slaughter in Gaza. So, so far, the interim report is disappointing, terribly disappointing for any of us who had hoped that Israel and that the Israeli public would listen and look in the mirror and require their politicians to abide by the ruling. I, I There's a vignette I just want to move to just for, for one moment. I saw some, many, may, several of you will know that there is a, a, a leading civil rights lawyer um, in Israel called Michael Sfard, who's been involved in many of the legal challenges for Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian and Palestinian NGOs inside the Israeli legal system. He issued a series of postings on uh, X, formerly Twitter, this morning, um, noting that the current advisory opinion hearings, which I'll touch on, that are taking place this week at the International Court of Justice, following a referral by the General Assembly of a question, have not been the subject of any reporting in the national media in Israel other than ha in Haaretz newspaper. They're being totally ignored by the Israeli public, by the Israeli media across the board. And that just shows you the kind of closed world in which so many Israelis are living. Um, and and it, it it's relevant to what I was just saying. You, If the mirror isn't held up to you and there isn't a debate, an open debate about what the mirror is showing you, you're not going to listen or respond or learn. And of course, there's lots of reasons apart from not looking in the mirror, but the, the fact is that reporting in Israel is appalling. And um, my parents and others Hebrew speakers who monitor it are are feeding back that how poor it is. Um, that's not an excuse. It's just a fact, and it's getting in the way of, in my view, of of a proper discussion about what this all means and what Israel Israeli policy should or should not be. I'm not rose tinted spectacles about any of what could happen as a result of that, but I'm saying the first part of it, the analysis, the discussion, is extremely limited. Um, there's one other thing to, to say, and of course, the, the output that is coming out is incredibly uh, prejudicial, racist, um, a lot of it, and it's being monitored. Um, 
So the answer to the question is not a lot has really changed or not sufficient. It's difficult, of course, to say whether things could have been even worse had there not been all those hearings in January. Um, I suppose we'll never know. Um, but um, my hope remains, as I'm going to set out, that the legal ramifications across the globe will have the impact combined with the scrutiny that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Israel will get. So look, let's start with the order itself because it's worth reiterating it. I know I'm speaking to a very knowledgeable audience, but um, so bear with me if you know all this inside out, I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing. So at paragraph 86 of the ruling on the um, 26th of January, the court laid out six provisional measures. Um, there were votes of 15 to two for several of them and 15 to one with the Israeli ad hoc judge joining two of the four provisional measures, even though he opposed the making of an order in principle at all. And he set out a separate ruling why explaining why he opposed that, which could take a seminar on its own to ana analyze and, and strip down. But it, it, so he said some extraordinary things, including um, the characterization of some of his own rulings when he was chief justice in, in the Supreme Court in Israel. But interestingly, he voted for two of the provision two or two of the six provisional measures, leaving the Ugandan judge on her own as the only judge in the world court that opposed to two of the measures. So 15 to 2, State of Israel shall, in accordance with its obligations under the uh, genocide convention the full title is the convention on the prevention i'll come back to that and punishment of the crime of genocide in relation uh, in relation to palestinians in gaza it was told to take all measures within its pound to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of article two of the convention in particular and then it reads out the prohibited acts in article two each of which could be evidence of the crime of genocide, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflict, inflicting on the group conditions of life, calculating to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. For those of you who have not read the 84-page uh, um, application to the court from 29th of December 2023. I really commend you to read it. Obviously, I'm not going to spend this evening reading from it, but please note the section on the impact on women, pregnant women, um, women who've just given birth, and the, the devastating impact it's had on on the on births and and deaths of young babies it's been very significant and underreported um there's a whole section on it uh, i really think everyone who hasn't read it should do so uh, by 15 votes to 2 the second provisional measure is that israel shall ensure with immediate effect that its military does not commit any of the acts described in point 1 above so a kind of buttressing set of a provision there for, for, for the second one and the same 15 to 2 vote. And these are the two that um, Barak, the ad hoc Israeli judge, voted for, a 16 to 1. State of Israel should take all measures within its power to prevent and punish the direct and public incitement to commit genocide in relation to members of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. Now, just think about it. The Israeli judge who opposed the making of an order felt that Israel obviously needed to be told and directed and ordered to, to repress um, acts of incitement. So, and yet, Israeli politicians, I don't know whether you saw the Israeli politicians speaking in the Knesset just in the last two days, two of their ministers in the last two days issued some of the most horrific genocidal statements in the course of, of parliamentary hearings. So, and... Um, by the way, um, after the the, um, the case was uh, put to the ICJ at the end of December, uh, Michael Svard published a letter that he'd written on behalf of um, a group of uh, Israeli citizens demanding that there was a proper investigation by the Attorney General in Israel of it of uh, in in accordance with the law in Israel on incitement. And you may or may not be aware, but the death penalty still exists in Israel 
for incitement to commit genocide. All um, crimes under the Genocide Convention, which were domesticated in Israeli law soon after it ratified the convention, currently include the death penalty. Um, so, you know, the seriousness with which the law on paper takes these acts is not matched by Israel's compliance with its duties. But it's, it, it is an extraordinary fact that Barak voted to require Israel to comply with its own law on this. Likewise, and he, he talked about his own experiences in the uh, Second World War and as a survivor of the Holocaust in relation to his vote on this, Israel shall take immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. This has been one of the most egregious breaches by Israel of, of an order. Um, and I'll come on to that brief, briefly in a moment. Um, the next one, number five, shall take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence related to allegations of acts within the scope of Article 2 and 3 of the Convention, so it mustn't destroy the evidence. And finally, six, submit a report to the court on all measures taken to give effect to this order within one month as from the date of this order. So that's within one month, could be on or before the 26th of February. Some people think they'll report tomorrow, might do the weekend. Um, I don't think it would be a breach of the order if it was on Monday. Uh, but expect, uh, obviously, the South African legal team and lots of people across the world have been watching each of these provisions, each of these requirements, and are waiting for um, how Israel will respond. In my view, they will respond. There will be a report. And just turning to paragraph 82 of the ruling, what that said about it, it's in, not in the actual provisional measure, but this is what it said at paragraph 82. Um, the report so provided that shall then be communicated to South Africa, which shall be given the opportunity to submit to the court its comments thereon. So South Africa will comment on it, and uh, I'm sure they are preparing for all the considerable um, untruths that we expect to see in this report. I haven't seen a single Israeli uh, prosecuted for incitement let alone arrested or, you know, <laughs> anything going on on that front. So I don't know what they're going to say about that. Um, there is a probe in Haaretz. There was an article about three days ago saying that they've started a probe into Israeli acts, including on the 7th of October itself. And there's an indication that that probe um, will be, will include certain allegations made against Israeli soldiers. And just in the last few days, they, the Israeli military claim that they are looking into certain allegations made as a result of massive uh, publication of videos on TikTok and on our Telegram channel. Uh, but let's see what they put into that report. So uh, quickly, uh, because I appreciate uh, uh, time has run on so quickly, um, I thought I would have got through those in about five minutes, but we're already well into my time. So let me just quickly touch on this. Um, there's a report by Gisha, one of the one of the Israeli human rights organizations, which just describes the horrific circumstances, the, the worsening of the situation in the Gaza Strip in terms of that um, provisional measure four. Um, I mean, let me just give you a few stats, which you may not. Hunger is rampant. This is particularly northern Gaza. Um, dangerous starvation is especially acute in northern Gaza, where about a third of residents suffer from catastrophic food sort sort shortages. Some 15% of children under the age of two are acutely malnourished. According to reports, residents in the north of Gaza are being compelled to forage wild herbs or animal fodder ground into flour, the availability of which is decreasing, and drinking polluted water for lack of other options. Israel claims that it does not limit the amount of aid entering Gaza. This is Geisha today or hinder its transit. The facts on the ground indicate it, it is denying residents in the area adequate access to essential humanitarian aid. According to OCHA, UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, Israel systematically prevents aid from crossing into areas north of the Wadi Gaza and has recently denied more than half of aid missions to the area. It's also denied access to some 90% of the requests by aid organizations to provide fuel for health and sanitation systems in the north. And then others may have seen this. There's a CNN report out in the last 24, 36 hours of a 
targeted attack on the 5th of February, so weeks after this order, a week, week or more after the order was made, where Israel bombed an aid truck loaded with food before it had begun transiting to the north of the Strip. So they let them in sometimes, but they sometimes bomb them, is the short answer. Um, so these, this is a blatant uh, breach of that provision. So these provisions are being breached left, right and centre. But what I want to focus on, therefore, is the legal impact and why I think it will have ripples and cause eventually the kind of pressures on third party states that will have the kind of impact that might stop Israel uh, in its tracks. And we've got to hope that it does. Uh, and it, But it won't happen without a lot of lawyering across the world and 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 civil society coming forward and continually pressing states to comply with their obligations and what are these obligations well the the for me in short the implications the the the, the jurisprudence basically says this once a state is aware of the risk of genocide it has a positive duty to do all within its power to prevent it if you have a ruling as you have a ruling that there is a plausible argument that genocide is being committed. It's quite clear, you don't need to be a lawyer, but it helps sometimes to do that. To be clear, we have passed the point where any state can argue there's no risk. That there is a risk of genocide at the minimum, because you can't have a situation where you've got a plausible genocide, argument of genocide or breaches of the genocide convention and not have had the risk. You've passed that point. And the jurisprudence makes it clear once you are aware of the risk, and nobody can claim they're not aware of the risk, unless they've lived underground for the last four months, you have a positive duty to act. Now, what does that consist of? Um, well, arguably, a huge amount, and a far more than's happened already. So um, let me just repeat a few things that are said in the courts. In the court's ruling at paragraph 33, this is the, the one on the 26th January, this was said, all states party to the convention have a common interest to ensure the prevention, suppression and punishment of genocide by committing themselves to fulfilling the obligations contained in the convention. Such a common interest implies that the obligations in question are owed by any state party to all other state parties. These are called erga omnes parties obligations in the sense that each party has an interest in compliance with them in any given case. So it's also considered to be so there's an ergo omnis duty, but these are so core to human rights, um, the integrity of human rights and the integrity of international law, that the norms around the Genocide Convention are considered to be what are called Jus Kogan's norms. They are non-derogable. They are core to compliance with international law and international criminal law. And that's why they're in the Rome Statute. So these are peremptory norms, which states have a positive duty when you, you have a parental parental norm you've got an added duty as a state to bring to an end through lawful means the breach of that parental norm and states mustn't recognize as lawful a situation created by a breach nor render aid or assistance in maintaining that situation so in essence this is a total uh, the only way of interpreting what's going on here is that there's a duty on states to stop all forms of trade aid with Israel. Um, Philippe Sands, when when addressing the court on behalf of Palestine, when he opened the advisory opinion uh, advocacy for them, said just in the last few days, um, he, he had, had a wonderful sentence where he said, no aid, no trade, no nothing, period. You shut down relations, trade, arms trade, ordinary trade, diplomatic exchanges. That is what could be done. That's what states have within their power to do. And in my view, the arguments to, to our politicians are the order on 26 January changes the legal landscape. You, by failing to take positive acts to stop the genocide or the, the risk of genocide even in um, Gaza, are now breaching your positive duties to prevent, you may be complicit, which is a whole different range of things, because complicity in, implies criminal criminality on the part of those who fail to then prevent the genocide carrying on. 
So there's certainly breach of the convention in, in a, a public international law by failing to act on the risk. And they arguably are also now complicit in the genocide, which is, let, means that they're the people who, who who render aid and assistance to the existing situation are in themselves complicit and, and open to criminal liability. In my view, it's just a matter of time before one or more states begins a new chapter of the litigation in the ICJ and brings a case of, of the separate breach of the failure to act on the risk and potentially complicity at the International Court of Justice. So I think that's coming down the line at some point. Um, so what I'm aware of, because I'm conscious of time and I don't want to reduce to, to nothing the, the discussion period, is a lot of litigation around various uh, jurisdictions that's ongoing, some of it successful, some of it unsuccessful. But that doesn't mean that we're wrong in our legal argument. The courts are wrong, in my view, in, in failing to um, take notice of the, the legal landscape changing on the 26th of January. Um, just before I mention those, I just want to say that um, I want to do in the time available, I don't want to do more on complicity because I think that the low hanging fruit really is the failure to act on the risk. Um, yeah, so you can be in breach of that duty on the risk. A state may be found, this, this is jurisprudence from um, earlier cases at the ICJ. A state may be found to have violated its obligation to prevent, even though it had no certainty at the time when it should have acted, but failed to do so that genocide was about to be committed or underway. For it to incur responsibility on this space, it's enough that the state was aware or should normally have been aware of the serious danger that acts of genocide would be committed. I'm really trying to emphasize the point that the risk that, that we that the duties on states have clearly crystallized we, we're not in a gray area on this whole issue i don't think we were in a particularly gray area before the 26th but we're in no way could be in a gray area so the kind of acts that we saw recently with the defunding on the flimsiest grounds of unra combined with what's happened on the 26th of january shows a complete disregard for international humanitarian law and the genocide convention. Mm. Um, so what's been happening? Um, a few cases. The F-35 case in, in Holland, if you're not aware of it, uh, 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 on appeal. So they lost initially, but after the they lost, the ICJ ruling had come out and the appeals court in the Netherlands have ordered the government um, and it's become a, a, an active order, I think, in the last couple of days, I think the, the judgment was was last week, and they ordered the government within seven days to stop giving any parts for the F-35 uh, fighter jet to the Israeli authorities. That is being appealed by the government, so it's going up to their top court, but at the moment, that was a response in part, certainly to the actions of Israel anyway, but partly in response to what was going on at the ICJ. What we have is um, on, uh, Belgium, uh, the re one of part of a, a regional government in Belgium suspended two licenses for the export of gunpowder to Israel on the 6th of February. The Italian foreign minister Antonio Tajani announced on in January um, that following the start of the conflict on 7 October, Italy had halted all exports of weapon systems and military materials to Israel. Spain's foreign minister said last month, the country has not sold any arms to Israel since October, and there's now an embargo on weapon sales. However, there is some reports in Spain that, that there, there has been some ammunition sold to Israel in November, but they're saying that there's currently an embargo. Um, we have seen um, what um, Josep Borrell said recently about um, the, the need to stop all sales of arms. Um, and um, there is now pending litigation, I believe, will happen very soon in Germany and other countries. Uh, sadly, the, the litigation that was brought in this country to try and stop licenses, they didn't get past the permission stage that we call it. There's a judicial review challenging the licenses. I am sure that the legal team there are considering an appeal against that. But across the globe, there should be 
actions taken to monitor the dual nationals coming back from Israel with a with a view to looking at what their conduct has been. There should be and there will be more and more litigation across the globe about states in terms of their duty to comply with this uh, this order and the and and the fact they need to prevent the risk or act on the risk of genocide at the minimum. Um, there will be a series of other initiatives. There are something I don't know whether people here are aware of um, the the Magnitsky sanctions uh, that came in some year some years ago. Um, so the government first used this law in 2020 after um, the Saudis um, were alleged to have murdered the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And it's since been used mostly as a political tool against states like Russia and North Korea. Um, but we have seen sanctions, including against some Israeli settlers, started in America and in this country. More of that kind of action can be expected in relation to conduct in Gaza. Um, and the you may or may not be aware, but the Arab Organization for Human Rights has already um, started to challenge the British government about what it is doing to look at where the money trail goes in relation to um, assisting or aiding and abetting um, criminality in Palestine, Israel. Um, obviously, I will be working and am working with a very significant number of lawyers across the globe on looking out for opportunities for universal jurisdiction to be exercised. We don't just have the problem that was created by the coalition government making it more difficult for lawyers like me to get arrest warrants. We also have a problem with something called special mission immunity, which I can explain more if you like. But basically, if you want to invite anybody from the current government um, who isn't already immune from national state's jurisdiction, and, and certain of the top leadership while they're in office are immune from national courts. Um, you can give them something called special mission immunity, which is actually what Zippy Livni benefited from um, when she visited after she ceased being in government. So this was a second occasion when she came to the UK after the coalition government changed the law. But notwithstanding that, there will be um, actions taken across the globe um, South Africa finally has said, and its law is very clear on it, it criminalises fighting for an army when you're a citizen of South Africa, regardless of dual citizenship. So it will be monitoring all the South Africans that come back after fighting um, in, in for Israel. And um, there will be criminal cases brought against them. They've made that clear where, where there's evidence that they've done that. And that's regardless of whether they've actually been involved in alleged war crimes. Um, I'm conscious of the time I've gone over what I intended to, to say tonight um, and I'm happy to try to answer any of your questions with the last di a disclaimer at the end. While I've spoken a lot about the Genocide Convention and about the ICJ, my particular expertise is in international criminal law and building evidence files and going to the police and trying to get criminal investigations and uh, one of them has did result in a in a criminal prosecution of a colonel that was uh, prosecuted for torture. Unfortunately, the jury didn't convict him. Um, but there is scope in this country, and the courts have shown the ability to 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 um, prosecute cases where there's uh, alleged torture or war crimes committed abroad. We've done it here. It's capable of happening. Just needs to happen more often. I'll stop there. Very good. Thank you very much, um, Daniel. Um, now, if anybody got any questions, um, would they please put them in the uh, chat and um, I will uh, relay them at the appropriate uh, time. Um, and while we're waiting for others to put forward questions, I've got a couple of, of my own. Um, uh, the International Criminal Court is, is also uh, yeah. active at present looking into things which have been going on in Israel and Palestine going back I think as far as 2013. Um, can you just explain how the two courts relate to each other or don't relate to each other and yeah. their different responsibilities? I think yeah. people might that, find that interesting. 
that's no problem. So briefly, historically, the around the, 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 after the Second World War, there had been a hope that there would be, as well as the International Court of Justice, which is like the civil court, the civil world court, which is part of the UN architecture, that there would also be an international criminal court. Unfortunately, as part of the whole Cold War disputes that occurred in the late 40s into the early 50s, that uh, consensus broke down. So there wasn't an international criminal court. Fast forward into the 1990s with a series of um, events in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the Security Council used its powers to set up ad hoc criminal tribunals. And that led to a wave of um, activity, a new wave of activity to try and get a, a, a new international criminal court set up. That resulted in the Rome Statute of 1998. And we in the UK, passed the International Criminal Court Act 2001. And then the once enough parties had ratified the Rome Statute, the court came into being in a, about 2002. So to, it's, it's a relatively new international court compared to the ICJ, which itself was, by the way, preceded by an equivalent under the League of Nations, the Permanent Court of Justice, as it was called before the end of the League of Nations and the start of the United Nations. So they're two separate legal systems and the um, International Criminal Court is not, it's not like a UN body, which the ICJ is. Uh, so it's a it's a creature of the Rome Statute. And um, you're right, it's, I think it's 2014 actually. So what happened is once, once Palestine uh, had enough legal argument that it was a state, it ratified the Rome Statute and referred itself to for investigation. So you can, there are several ways in which the court gets jurisdiction. One of them is through a Security Council resolution referring a country that's already ratified the Rome Statute um, or not, in fact. Um, but then the veto holding power of the Security Council 5 means only certain states are ever going to get a referral of that kind. And Russia's blocking one for Syria, for example. Um, but um, Palestine referred itself on becoming a state and ratifying the treaty. It took a hugely long amount of time for all of the provisional, the, the sort of a jurisdictional issues to be addressed. And it wasn't until Ben Souda, who was then the chief prosecutor, ref brought um, a legal argument into one of the chambers of the court to say, do we have the power given all the disputes that Israel has about Palestine, et cetera, et cetera, are, are, can we actually start a criminal investigation? And in 2021, towards the end of her time as the um, chief prosecutor, there was a ruling that said that there was, and she started the criminal investigation in 2021. Then came along Kareem Khan, the new prosecutor, British barrister, um, and very, very little happened in the two years before the beginning of two plus years between his appointment and the beginning of the Gaza war. And um, there's huge disappointment that within um, within a relatively uh, small amount of time after the referral of the situation in Ukraine, the there were arrest warrants for Putin and one other by the court. There is more than enough evidence. Just take settlements, for example. There is no factual dispute about the settlements. Israel's not disputing the settlements. The international community almost unanimously, bar maybe the Mauritius Islands or one or two others, actually disputes that these are illegal settlements and that there are they involve grave breaches, therefore war crimes, contrary to the Fourth Geneva Convention. The chain of command is clear. There's no problem issuing an arrest warrant for the criminality involved in the settlements in the West Bank. That could have happened in, in 2021. I don't know what's happening. So, and for for example, the the um the, the war crimes related to that arise from the collective punishment and the starvation, again, there's more than enough evidence. He has to go to a chamber to get an arrest warrant, but he's had enough time to do that. So there you are. It's an incredibly disappointing um, way in which the court has conducted itself. Um, 
he has his defenders amongst some international criminal lawyers, but it's it's far too slow. And he's only just issued a few words, some recently stronger words, warning, don't complain later if you just carry on breaching the law. But I don't think Palestinians in Gaza think that's enough. And I think I agree with them. So there was some one of the questions that's come in that suggests that there was some warning by quite a large number of lawyers and a couple of MPs, Alan Duncan and Kristen Blunt, I think, back in October, yep. November, that there were possible crimes being committed. Uh, has, has that had any effect uh, at all in um, with our government or even indeed uh, the official opposition in terms of their attitude towards um, possible criminal behaviour? Well, I mean, you tell me. I haven't seen. I haven't seen enough of a enough of an understanding or response. Again, it it should be the discourse of politics. One, what are the crimes that are involved? Why are we not doing more to prevent them? Why are we not funding the International Criminal Court and and saying to the International Criminal Court, wake up, do your job properly? Why are we not acting on the ICJ's order of the twenty sixth of January? All of this is to say that there's been a dereliction of duty um, by politicians across the world. Um, and, and what we see is a failure to deter crimes. And this is now not even particularly controversial anymore. Um, and the American president, um, our own prime minister, they keep on talking about too many civilians have died. Well, what does that mean? That means there must have been or certainly allegations, serious allegations of crimes, you don't need more than that to start grant issuing arrest warrants. Nobody's convicted when that happens. You're just saying the evidence supports a serious war crimes investigation, and that might in itself deter more criminality. I mean, it's obvious. Um, if you don't make arrests under various criminal laws, if we started, if we started saying until somebody's killed 40 people, we're not going to start trying to arrest them for a potentially being a mass murderer then you know they're gonna they're gonna carry on aren't they um and um it's it doesn't take much thinking to see that the impact of the deterrence of criminal law is isn't hasn't isn't being um applied anyway carry on what other questions can i help well, John Garrett has asked the question, um, after the ICJ has reviewed Israel's response to its January 26 ruling, what do you think is the likelihood that it might then order a ceasefire? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I'd like, I can't say about the likelihood. I think they ducked it in circumstances where I sort of understand. So because they failed, in my view, on sufficient evidence at the time to say, they don't, by the way, I don't think that South African request has been misrepresented. They understood that with Hamas not in court, a ceasefire in terms of all ceasefire is not something they actually asked for. What they said is there must be a cessation of Israeli military operations. So that's Israel must stop. Now, if Israel in the armed forces that remain in the Gaza Strip, in my view, unlawfully, were to be attacked by militants, they can defend themselves against attack. No one's suggesting they can't do that. If there were to be an attempt by militants to or to fire rockets, that can be the, the Iron Dome thing exists. They can, can intercept rockets. No one's suggesting they have to have a complete hands down situation. That's the lie that has been perpetuated by the Labour Party and many politicians, as if we're saying that if Israel stops its huge military onslaught, it can't then in some way defend itself or its citizens against actual attacks by militants. It can do. The, the, the two are not mutually, you know, it's a, it's a ridiculous um, false dichotomy. So what the court could order, and I hope it does, is that and what was requested as a provisional measure by the South Africans, Israel cease all its military operations in the Gaza Strip. You can't really have humanitarian aid and all the other things that the court has ordered, in fact, in my view, without that. And some people interpreted the ICJ's wishes, despite not making that part of their orders, is that that's really what they were driving at. Now, the, the comment they made in response to South Africa calling upon um, the court to use its own initiative, so it's got the power to issue more provisional measures without actually being asked. 
Mm. And South Africans reminded them they can also, by the way, be asked by South Africa positively to amend on the basis of a, a material change of circumstances to make another order. So I think what South Africa will do, they will respond to whatever Israel puts in. They will eviscerate because it will require evisceration, what Israel says on the 26th of um, February or before. And it will ask for a hearing, potentially, for the for, to consider their revised application for the measure of a cessation of Israeli military activity. And I hope, but I don't say that it will happen, I hope the court does respond and does issue that new provisional measure. I can't see how else Israel is going to be stopped, frankly. Um, uh, though we hear in the news, if Israel does attack Rafa um, in the next few days, as threatened, the British government has apparently mooted. I know the Palestinians were trying to get clarification for that, the delegation in the UK today, as to the reports in The Guardian that the, that the British government would finally stop selling arms to Israel. Um, that's ridiculous. They should have stopped after the 26th of January, before the 26th of January, they shouldn't need to wait for yet more deaths. That should have happened already. But maybe, maybe finally it will. Um, but not before even more people die. Um, can you can you just um, clarify one question? Again, Claire has asked about the recognition of the jurisdiction of the two courts. Um, uh, and suggesting that the US doesn't recognize them. My, my understanding is that um, the US and Israel are two of relatively few countries that don't recognize the ICC, but that, that everybody who's a member of the United Nations recognizes the ICJ. Am yeah. I or am I wrong? Well, no, there are, you can have there are, you can have uh, reservations to various treaties. You can have after the Nicaragua case, the USA put in a kind of general reservation. So yeah. There are problems with the jurisdiction of the court um, against certain, automatically against certain states, certainly in the case of all conventions. You can make, and certain, some states have made reservations to the genocide convention. So they would have to lift their reservation or um, uh, agree to or vary the, the reservation. So basically the, the ICJ um is a, it, you can only get into the ICJ against states where there's um, where you don't have reservations under certain treaties for disputes to be resolved or customary international law cases can be brought, but they they can you can have some form of reservation against being sued even while a, you're a UN member state. So it's quite complicated. I'm not a full expert on ICJ jurisdiction, but that's my understanding. If someone who's better educated about the ICJ's jurisdictional boundaries knows the answer. They can say that I am be better qualified to talk about the ICC. So Israel has not ratified the Rome Statute. Um, it's not recognised the competence of the court. However, it's clear that some of Israeli citizens are trying to use the jurisdiction of the court on the refer, ironically, or just as a matter of fact, because Palestine referred itself, Palestinian citizens or Palestinian residents of Gaza who go into Israel and commit alleged war crimes are under the jurisdiction of the court. So mm -hmm. they they can validly say, uh, and many people have commented that if Karim Khan does ask a chamber of the court at the ICC to issue arrest warrants, what we will see are two-sidism, that he will be under pressure from certain states like the US, that if he were to ever issue arrest warrants, he would have to do so against Hamas for the 7th of October. I don't object to that personally. And a lot of Palestinian lawyers say, fine, bring it on. As long as we're gonna get justice for Gazans, if you want to uh, start prosecuting Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants for alleged war crimes, knock yourselves out. But if it's only going to be Hamas militants, something's badly wrong. As I said, there should have been arrest warrants and prosecutions in relation to the settlements. That it's just legal argument. There's no factual dispute. So, um, uh, unlike a lot of these things where Israel disputes, it says, "Well, no, we have committed. We bombed this area. We've acted proportionately. Here's the military target. Here's what we did." And so, you've got a kind of factual dispute about is this a war crime or not? In the case of the settlements, the settlements are illegal. 
certain actions that involve displacing it, Palestinians or bringing in your own population are just war crimes. So what's the dispute? It's just legal. Mm -hmm. it, are these illegal settlements or not? Not the facts. So as I say, um, that's where we are. So I hope that's actually answered the question. So um, uh, all events since 2014 are subject to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, whether it's Israelis committing crimes towards Palestinians in the territories, or whether it's Palestinians alleged to have committed crimes um, at, within or outside the territories, um, because that's the way that the, the jurisdiction works. Mm -hmm. mm. So Judy Steele has asked a question about um, what she perceives as a relative lack of interest by the British media in the, um, you know, what's been going on with the International Criminal Court and wonders what could be done to raise the level of public um, uh, interest in, in this. Is, Everybody... it, is, it, is, it, is it because of the politicians or is it just the media not... It's, or... it, 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 it's a lack of proper attention to key legal principles day in day out we need to be talking to our mps talking to our friends talking to our neighbors if we can if they can tolerate us talking to them about this and um raising this in the public consciousness trying to get the media to report things properly offering to appear on the media um you know whatever it is um just raising the consciousness of the the jurisdiction of the both both international uh, tribunals, um, and and raising the, the need to act on the risk of genocide as being a positive duty on all our pol public policymakers. Um, so yeah, every every possible opportunity to to speak out and to educate people around us. It's really difficult in the social media age because you know you end up especially on social media talking to. You know, the same people who already know about all this it's reaching out beyond that and that's why the demonstrations on the streets i think have been you know do raise public consciousness you know hundreds of thousands of people going out on the streets the media can't completely ignore them um but they're not really listening to our message yeah you commented earlier that part of the problem in israel itself was that uh, with the exception of haaretz uh, there was virtually no coverage of the, um, you know, what had been going on in the International Court of Justice in in Israel, and it prompts me to ask the question also that, um, you know, we've had presentations over the years, webinars, and indeed in, in some cases speakers in person from Breaking the Silence, Beth Salam, Ikad, maybe one or two other um, Israeli NGOs. Um, have they have they all sort of maintained their their sort of high profile on sort of human rights of Palestinians, international human rights law, or or have they been rather sort of um, intimidated to sort of mute their criticism while while their country's on a war footing? Do you think? Uh, I think a, a minority of the Israeli human rights um, organisations have felt very very under siege and. Um, some of them that I've spoken to have complained about a lack of 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 uh, recognition of um, some of the events on the 7th of October. I think it's fair to say. But my general sense of it is that the key organisations have been speaking out, trying to do what they can, uh, joining in with the international NGO um, uh, organisations and, and speaking out effectively. So I think it's only had a marginal impact. Um, what's interesting is learning about the amount of action, particularly against um, non-Jews in Israel, on speaking out. But there's been this massive assault on a parliamentarian who wanted to support the ICJ um, action, and he was nearly expelled from parliament. It was a very close vote. He was impeached. Um, or it was a failure to impeach him, but by a very small number of votes. Um, so you can see the amount of vitriol and um, opprobrium that's piled on people that want to speak the human rights discourse. And, you know, it's it, it essentially, I think what's happening, and it's not unique to Israel, I'm afraid, is we're having um, a kind of real lurch towards fascism, um, you know, in many countries, 
currently. And Israel is seeing a very, its own particular brand of, in my view, you know, fascistic um, attitudes towards um, minorities and um, and the way that the government is run and, and the, the way public discourse is conducted. It's um, the, the repression of freedom of speech in Israel under the guise of security and um, and other excuses is is horrendous. Um, changing changing tack a bit. Um, Adrian Litvinov asked uh, an interesting question about the um, the current legislation going through Parliament to prevent public bodies from boycotting Israeli goods and services, and wonders whether this in itself is a potential breach of the Genocide Convention. Yes, I don't know whether that. Well, yes, I mean, I think it, I think it would be because we we I think there's a real argument to say that the British government, in seeking to um, prevent uh, local authorities from making those kind of decisions, is in itself stymieing attempts to to comply with the risk the the deposited duty, um, and that should be argued in Parliament by when opposing this current bill when it goes through that Gove is in effect. Um, at the public international law level is is guilty of putting forward a bill that would be um that's is actually causing a risk of um of complicity going beyond the failure to to prevent the risk that having such a bill pass right now while we have a, an ongoing genocide would be a breach of the genocide convention it's an interesting thought i hadn't actually thought through that those arguments could be put. I have a load of other arguments already because of the way the bill was being presented. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it becomes a thought crime. I, th I don't know whether people understand that this bill has a provision in it that you can't say that but for this Act of Parliament, I would have passed a... I would have wanted to um, not have a trade trading with this particular waste management company because of its role in in providing services to the to the settlements in the West Bank, for example, that would be a, that's a criminal that would be criminalized under this bill because it's a thought crime. But there's a specific provision in the in the bill to make that a, a crime on the part of a of a local authority decision maker, which is the most extraordinary thing. Uh, talking about fascism. Anyone else with anything else that I can address, John? I think we've covered most of the um, uh, the topics that people raised in the chat. Um, I, I really... saw one question flash up about proportionality. Can I just mention briefly that back sure. in yes, back in two thousand yeah. back in two thousand and two, uh, the Bush government uh, presidency and the Labour Party um, in power at the time were up in arms with Israel because they targeted a Palestinian militant. This is in July of 2002, called Shahade, in which they killed seven family members and seven others who were living in the same apartment block that was bombed by Israel. They themselves at the time made that clear that was a alleged war crime. And that was one of the crimes that Doron Almog had an arrest warrant for him, one of the five that we put forward to the court in the UK because he was in the chain of command at the time. So it's absolutely clear to me that there's unanimity that to, when you target one individual commander and you know full well that you're at risk of killing those kind of numbers of civilians, that's a war crime. Fast forward 31st of October, 1st of November, 2023. What did Israel do? It targeted one Hamas commander in Jabalia, Jabalia uh, refugee camp. It dropped, this was a one, one ton bomb it dropped back in 2002. It dropped three one ton bombs, destroying, decimating a huge area in Jabalia refugee camp, killing well over a hundred civilians, well over a hundred civilians. If we'd only made sure that Almog was arrested here in London, as he should have been in 2005 and put on trial in the UK or done anything to suppress the crimes which were identified back then in earlier 
attacks, both before and after Israel's um, tactical withdrawal of troops on the ground, the number of times these kind of attacks have happened, clear war crimes in my view, and not been suppressed, is where we've got to during this Israeli response to the 7th of October. Total gloves off, total disregard for international criminal law, international humanitarian law, clearly disproportionate um, acts which should be being prosecuted right now. So I, I can only show you in that example how the international community treated a, um, a particular instance back in 2002, including you know Jack Straw and others condemning Israel's actions. There were stronger words then for that act than I've heard for almost any act until mo the most recent days when there's been finally the kind of language that you'd expect the politicians to have been talking about on, you know, early in October, and certainly by the middle of October, we were seeing significant uh, bombings, disproportionate international crimes, in my view. So I hope that answers the person who asked about the proportionality point. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure it does. And on that somber note, I think, um, we might draw the questions to a close and thank you very warmly, uh, Daniel, for a most interesting presentation and um, series of answers to to the questions. Uh, thank thank you. I, I want point. to I want to just end with one com comment, which is from a Palestinian lawyer who requires me every time we finish a conversation that's as somber as this to say we must maintain the strategic optimism. And if he can say that and still says that after surviving uh, for the first six or seven weeks of the Gaza war when he managed to escape and still tells me that that's that's a view I have to to put across to everyone. We have to maintain the strategic optimism. We've got to keep fighting. Um, there's no way that um, any of us has the, in my case, the kind of uh, any anything other than to carry on battling for 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 things to change. So yes. that's my that's how I'd like to leave things. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Daniel. I'd, li I'd like to pass now uh, to B Belinda uh, to tell us about the um, upcoming events that um, Justice Palestinians has on its agenda. Belinda, please. You are muted, Belinda. Oh, Zoom. Um, thanks again, Daniel. That was really inspiring. And particularly, thank you for leaving us with that final comment because. You know, how can we not be optimistic if Palestinians are living through this and maintain optimism? So, of course, we continue. Um, just to say Justice for Palestinians will be continuing its weekly vigils. Um, and I've put into the chat function the dates of future ones. I'll be pushing that on Facebook and on in mailings. But uh, it's a it used to be a monthly vigil, but of course now it's a weekly one. Um, it's against the occupation for a ceasefire. We'll be outside Leamington Town Hall this week from um, on Saturday from 11 till noon, um, Kenilworth the following week, and then we'll continue the pattern of Leamington, Warwick, Leamington, Kenilworth. We're all also, in response to requests from some supporters in Stratford, going to do an additional one on the afternoon of the 16th of March in Stratford-on-Avon. Um, to help the Stratford supporters build up their own activities there. Um, our next meeting is on the 11th of March. It's going to be an in-person meeting, and our speaker is Hannah Weisfeld from Yakud UK, which is an organisation, um, a British Jewish organisation, working to support a political resolution in the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Um, I see there's a question about when the recording will be made available. We'll try to get it on YouTube as quickly as we can we get from Zoom the recording pretty quickly. So if anyone who can't wait for us to put on YouTube, let me know within reason, but uh, we'll get that onto our YouTube channel as soon as we can. Um, we are looking at organizing further meetings in the coming months and we'll keep you posted about those. Thanks very much again. Thank you, Belinda. And thank you very much again, Daniel. Hope to see most of you at uh, one of the vigils in the next week or two and at uh, the public meeting with Hannah Weisfeld in a few weeks' time. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.